Hello everybody and welcome back to the second episode of the UK Glamping Podcast hosted by Glampertect. So as you know, over the next few weeks and months we're going to be talking you through all the stages in setting up your own glamping site. So with that in mind, uh, we thought what better guest to get involved than uh, CEO of Glam Protect himself, Callum McLeod, uh, a man who has been there, done that and got the t-shirt. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Callum. Hi guys, uh, I'm waving there, I don't know if people can see me or not, if this is just just uh, noise, uh, just sound, but I'm waving <laughs> if uh, we're not on YouTube. It will uh, depend how they're listening. Uh, they they can find us on YouTube, they can also find us on Spotify and uh, Apple as well, so pick your medium so the lucky few will be able to be blessed with our pretty faces good oh yeah hi guys um and yeah thanks for having me ollie thank you for running this as well it's obviously great to um, bring back the podcast it was so valuable for people for so long um so yeah it's great that you're picking it back up well done yeah thanks very much um so tell us a little bit about yourself and your background callum yeah so um a lot of you guys that are listening probably get a lot of emails from me, so probably know about as much um, about me as I do. Um, but I am Callum. I um, set up my first glamping site around about five years ago. Before that, I was an electrical design engineer. Um, very short uh, story as to how I got into glamping. My mum and dad had some land that they weren't using, and it was on a um, popular tourist route, the North Coast 500. And so I um, had some skills with um, CAD and with planning applications through my job at the time. Um, and so I put in a planning application to set up a site. <clears throat> it very quickly got approved and then I had no money. So um, I, um, I, I pretty much didn't have anything to do a glamping site other than a bit of an idea at the start. Um, managed to speak to um, one of my cousin's good friends uh, and he actually invested in the site and um, not to anybody thinking about setting up a site that doesn't have the money money is probably closer to home than you would think um, so yeah bear that in mind when um, when you are thinking about it so yeah from there um, we built the site and as we were building the site i was actually at the glamping show and i was walking around the glamping show and i was looking at all of the um, manufacturers that were there and I was looking at all the attendees that were there and I was thinking all these people have such a long way to go to get to the point where they're actually ready to buy a pod. Um, yeah. I have just done all the stuff that they need to do and it's hard, it's confusing, it takes a long time, it's expensive, um, It had I had skills to do it that not many people have so there was a whole host of things that you know, this is pretty challenging to get those people from where they are today to being ready to buy pods. Um, and so I set up Glampitect and um, that, you know, is kind of what brings us uh, here today. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of the, the quick tour as to how Glampitect started. We've obviously recently been in the news about our new site in the NEC uh, in Birmingham. It's been, uh, that's been going for three or four years now. Um, so it's good to finally be able to publicly talk about that. I've, I've been, you know, having to keep it fairly quiet um, for a long time. But yeah, it's, it's great to be able to publicly talk about that too. So yeah, that's the next one. Um, and we're also hoping to partner with landowners to do sites throughout the country uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that's me. I'm mainly on the glamping piece rather than who I am personally. But I imagine you don't want to know that. <laughs> well, I'm sure some people would like to know, but maybe, <laughs> maybe a topic for another time. Yeah. Uh, but no, you're right. Really excited news about the site at the NEC. Um, whether people have seen that link with our name or linked with um, the company name Avant Glamp, um, we are one and the same. We fall under the same umbrella. Uh, really exciting times, obviously. So you mentioned there that you started with your own site on the North Coast 500, and obviously now we've got Glamp Protect. And three short years after that, I walked into your life and everything <laughs> everything went up. From you all got better. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, obviously, this Avant Glamp project, massive uh, project, 59, 60 pods um, down uh, at the NEC in Birmingham. A real kind of statement of intent um, from yourself and from the company. Um, what's next after that? Yeah, so more of the same. Um, Glamp Protect's got a, a really good position in that. Um, we have such a good solid team that have all been around for quite a while now. Um, you're probably one of the, the latest to come into the company and you know, you've know you been here for a year and a bit now. So, um, yeah, about a year and a half, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a year and a half, yes. Ah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it was before the year. So, you know, everyone's been in a while. Um, the, the team are all clued up on what they do when it comes to helping people set up glamping sites. So, Glamping Tech is very much just in a position that we can continue to do what we do and help people set up glamping sites um, right through the process. So, you know, that's in a great position. In terms of Avant Glamp, Again, it's, it's more of the same of the, the recent news is we're looking for more big sites, um, but um, at a more foundational core level, we're looking to partner with a lot of landowners um, that maybe have the land, but don't have the time, the money or the expertise or you know, one, or, one or two of them um, to actually set up a site. And, and we're looking to partner with them to deliver sites. So um, Fantastic. again, it's just from, from a problem that I saw, um, you know, Glam Protect, was created out of the problem that is there's a whole lot of people that want to set up sites and nobody to help them. Um, this is now the problem of there's a whole lot of people with land, but they don't have the time, the money or the expertise to do it. And, and we have all of those things. So um, yeah, looking forward to partnering with a lot more people. That's just coming up now. Um, and we're mm-hmm. kind of progressing with that as we speak. Yeah, really exciting to have that kind of extra string to our bow when we're talking to our, to our clients is that whether they want to do it themselves or whether they've just got a piece of land that they'd like to monetize, we've now got solutions for everybody. So if, if you are a landowner or even if you're looking at a piece of land and considering um, setting up, uh, all of the contact details will be below. Do please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. So you mentioned obviously your background prior to setting up at the North Coast 500 was, I think it's fair to say, pretty vastly different to a traditional glamping site owner. What, what was it that motivated you to get into it? Yeah, so I'll be honest, I, I tripped into it. I really did kind of stumble and trip. I'm not going to sit here and go, I sat and I wrote a list of every different industry in the world and I decided the glamping was going to be the one for me, which, by the way, probably quite a lot of people listening to this have done. Um, I know um, Cyrus and Gail, who are now my business partners in Avant Glamp, they invested early in the NEC. They literally did that. They sat and they were like, what is the industry that we want to get into? Um, they, they wrote down all of the things that they wanted um, from their future lives, and they landed on glamping. Um, and obviously fantastic for them and fantastic for everybody that's at home um, that is like that too. But yeah, I really did just trip into it. Um, and um, you know, the, the land was there, and I was it was actually my mum's idea. She was like, why don't we do a glamping site? And yeah, off we went. So, um, I am very fortunate to have tripped into glamping. Um, there's been really recent data um, shared that the UK glamping market is currently worth $200 million and uh, it is looking to grow at just over 10% year on year for the next six years. Um, and uh, if anybody's listening that wants to see that data, reach out to one of the guys they can send it across. Um, around about 50% of that is cabins and pods, which is obviously what we work in. So um, uh, for all I tripped into and it was a bit of an accident, now I'm here, like there really is not a better industry for me. And um, you know, with that growth, as well as what we're being able to deliver, it's, yeah, just really exciting. Fantastic. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a lot of us kind of discovered this industry probably over the last few years. And it's fair to say that I think COVID and lockdown really gave this kind of staycation market as a whole, um, a real kind of boost. Um, and again, as you said, there we've got all sorts of kind of statistics we can share with people about growth in the market. So with that in mind, obviously, the whole purpose of this podcast is to is to get people talking and get to people on another platform so they can start to wrap their heads around the steps they're involved. Um, what would you say was the kind of one particular hurdle that you found the most difficult to overcome when you were setting up? Yeah, so it's not necessarily one that I struggled with the most, but I know that it's the one that people struggle with the most. I'm I'm a bit weird that I just do stuff. I just (laughs) get an idea and I just run with it. But for most people, they, they have this idea of, you know, I want to set up this site and they get kind of bogged down by everything and they don't actually take the correct action towards doing it. Um, as I say, I was the complete opposite of that, that I, I, I do and I do and I do until I get to, you know, roughly where I want to get to. 
Um, but yeah, most people struggle with actually taking the steps towards um, delivering something. And so that would be the main thing that I would say is take action towards um, getting to your goal of setting up a glamping site. And probably along the way, a lot of people will fall off. You know, it is a hard journey. I'm not going to pretend that everyone will be able to do it. Um, it is tough, but it is super rewarding when you get to the end. Um, and I say at the end, it, it becomes a bit of a journey after that because you've got an open site where you're um, meeting people all day, every day. If, if you know, you're a, um, a person that stays nearby the site, um, or if you're just more of an investor, then you're, you'll still be managing things um, in some way or another. So yeah, that, that would be the, the main thing for me really is, um, I see a lot of people that don't take the correct action towards doing it. Um, and one philosophy that we've got in Avant Glamp um, just now is fail as cheaply and as quickly as possible. And I think that's really relevant to everybody that's looking to start a glamping site. Um, what would be the first thing that you could do to that? Write down all the reasons you want to do a glamping site and all the reasons you don't. And if you look and you go, you know what, on balance, I don't want to do that. That is cheap and that is quick. Great. <laughs> yeah, Put absolutely. Bed, go and do something else. Um, next steps is pick up the phone to, to one of you guys, um, Jack, Callum, uh, Ollie, or Imogen, and, and have a chat and, and you know see what you guys are saying. I know that you guys speak to people for a long time for free before we ever get to you know, a point that people are buying things. Again, same thing, feel, feel cheap and feel quickly. Um, next step would be a feasibility study. They are not expensive in the grand scheme of things and they get done in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, four weeks at most. So, um, you know, and obviously you want to get to that end goal of, of being open, but you would rather fail a, a £500 feasibility study than fail yeah. when you get planning approved and then can't afford the site. So yeah, um, my biggest piece of advice I don't know if you actually asked me for advice, but <laughs> my biggest piece would be feel as cheaply and as quickly as you can. No, really, really good piece of advice. And yeah, I, I can't reiterate that enough. Um, reach out, come and talk to me. If you've got questions, if you don't know where to start, start with us. Give us a call. Um, we'll see if we can't help kind of guide you through those first steps and start to shape your idea a little bit more. So obviously you've, you've got the benefit of a few years' experience of running a couple of sites now. Um, a lot of clients come to us and they don't, really know how involved they want to be with the day-to-day -day running of it. Now, I know our listeners won't know that obviously you're not on site yourself personally um, on a regular basis. So how have you how have you managed to get that to work? Yeah, so it was so scary and hard running a glamping site that I ran to a different continent. <laughs> <laughs> no, joking, I'm, I'm, for, for those of you who don't know, I do live in a different continent. I live in the Middle East. Um, I'm obviously backwards and forwards a lot for um, the stuff we've got going on at the NEC. Um, I try to get to the glamping tech team at least a couple of times a year. I'm usually at the glamping show and so on. So I do come back. Um, but from day one, uh, I still lived away from site. My first site, I was about 250 miles away from. I lived in Edinburgh and my first site was right in the north of Scotland. So Was that the uh, at Melvick site? Yeah, that was at yeah. Melvick site. Um, so I've always been super remote. Um, and it, it kind of forced my hand on a few things I'm actually really grateful for because... I know a lot of um, people that own sites probably think, oh, I'm not going to do too much. And then they live on site, so they get dragged into it. It forced me to really create systems and processes that meant that um, I was not needed other than, you know, the odd email or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, you can be as involved as you want to be. And I wouldn't say you really need to decide how involved you want to be until after planning has been approved. Um, that's the point that you're really going to start to create things that um, are harder to reverse. Um, feasibility stage, I wouldn't say. Planning, I wouldn't say. But yeah, once, once you start to you know, build, um, there's going to be things that you need to consider as to whether or not you want to be involved and how involved you want to be. And that is, I think, the beauty of the glamping industry is that you can be as involved um, or not as you want to be. I, I do very, very, very little um, on my NC500 pods business. Now I probably spend half an hour, an hour a month um, on it. It, it. There really is very little. On the flip side, there's people that could spend, you know, 50, 60 hours a week on their glamping site um, if that's what they wanted to do and everything in between. We're very fortunate that we've got 
And Christine, who is our manager, essentially, I would say, um, she started kind of helping out in the cleaning. She, well, she actually started helping on the build. Quick 20 seconds on that. Her husband was the builder um, on our second site. Oh, and, I didn't realise that. Yeah. And it was during COVID. So she wasn't working. She had, a, I think she was a, a nursery teacher. And um, she wasn't working. The site was next door to their house. And so he was building and she was like, well, I may as well just go and join him because I'm not doing anything else. <laughs> yeah. And so she went across um, like every day for two, three months, whatever. And then kind of came very sheepishly to me at the end of it after um, they completed the build. And she was like, I've loved it. Um, is there anything that I can do as a job to, to stay here? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, you've been fantastic and we would love for you to, it started the cleaning, but she's really kind of taking the rule by the horn. She now manages both her sites. She's got a laundry um, that she manages as well. We've got a team of people um, all kind of part time across both the sites that, um, that do all the cleaning and changeovers and stuff like that too. So um, yeah, we've been able to systemize well in that respect. And Christine does a fantastic job. She meets people. We got a lot of reviews saying Christine was fantastic. So for all I'm removed, we've still got that personal touch, which is great. Um, and the biggest thing when it comes to automating the business is a good booking system and yeah. a good website. Um, because, you know, I still see it to this day, the glamping sites that are taking bookings through Facebook Messenger and then a bank transfer and all of this carry on. Yeah. Like I've, I've had nights when I've gone to sleep, I don't check as much anymore, but back when I checked a lot more, there'd be nights that I would go to sleep, I'd wake up and we'd have made 5,000 pounds in bookings. And um, you can't possibly do that if you've got to send a Facebook message to, to take a booking. And obviously we're kind of at the, the peak of it, but there's you know varying degrees throughout that definitely make it harder to automate. Yeah, I think, you do see those kinds of systems, you're right, and they're exactly the kind of things that surprised me when I first started researching the industry, is that there is still a lot of catching up to do in some parts of the industry. And I think, given lockdown and the kind of incentives that were put in place as we came out of it, a lot of the early adopters when setting up glamping, I think it would be fair to say, got into it at the cheap end um, and went with the kind of more budget units, not necessarily on suite or not necessarily flushing toilets for example so with that in mind obviously a lot a lot of clients now want to know as glamping is picking up in popularity what the future of the industry looks like and i'd just like to pick your brains for a couple of minutes before we wrap up on how you see the next kind of three five ten years of the industry looking and whether you have any kind of concerns around potential saturation of the market yeah, so I wasn't sure if that was where you were going to lead with the question of saturation, but if you didn't, I was actually going to say it. Um, I, I get asked a lot, whether it's in podcasts or um, just generally a lot of the glamping show and stuff like that. Mm. Um, oh my God, there's so many sites opening. Um, when's saturation going to come? And yeah. my answer is always the same. It has been for like three or four years and it will continue to be this um, because we're already seeing it, is that there the site's quality is growing right year on year month on month to be honest site's quality is growing um back when i was first answering this question there was people that were literally throwing a, a wooden shed in their back garden with a gym mat for a bed they were charging 150 200 quid a night and they were getting it um and i said they'll be the first to go and they've gone um that has already happened um, don't get me wrong, they've still got their wooden shed in their back garden with the gym mat for a bed, but they either don't have people staying anymore or they're charging £70 a night, £80 a night, something like that, rather than the, the more premium prices. My my own first site, um, we have bookings at like £370, £380 a night in the summer. Um, so, wow. yeah, um, and, you know, compa comparison to some of this other stuff, like it's, it's night and day. Um, so I always said they were going to be the first ones to go, they've gone. Um, the next up is the guys that are a bit better, but not a lot. Um, I think there's a, a time and a place for the kind of no cooking facilities, no heating, no toilets, like that suits a certain type of market 
maybe like for example, I don't know the West Highland Way. That for those of you who don't know, there's a walk um, that's like I don't know how far it is. Maybe like hundred miles or something like that. It's like quite Similar a long walk. Thing, yeah, yeah you, you walk for like a week, and on that, that it very much has that. That is quite suited to that market. Um, that it's just a, a bed, maybe a couple of single beds, um, and no, like communal facilities and stuff like that. It may be 60, 70 pounds a night, whatever. And that kind of suits that market. But anyone that's trying to take that to a nice holiday location, they're going to start to struggle. Um, yeah. And the, the story continues. You know, the, the, there will be in a couple of years' time the, the slightly higher quality ones, maybe ones that have quite a poor ensuite and quite poor kitchen facilities, they'll start to fall off as well. Um, and so let's flip this on its head. Where's the positives? The positives are that as long as you deliver a really nice, quality accommodation in a good location, you're always going to be okay. In fact, you're going to be more than okay as we've proven with my first NC500 pod sites. We could have a, a booking, let's say it's, it's July. We have a booking cancel. We will get that rebooked in 24 hours um, because we're so desirable, because we're in a good location and we have a good quality accommodation offering. Um, once the kind of tipping point is met that supply meets demand, or maybe even the supply goes beyond demand in terms of glamping pods, glamping sites, to people that want to stay. Um, if you've got a good quality accommodation offering and you're in a good location, what does it matter? Um, people are going to come and stay with you and you're going to pay the rates that, they, that you want them to pay. Um, so that's why I'm investing so heavily in glamping right now. Um, I've not actually said yet on, on this, but with Avant Glamp, we're aiming to do a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand sites um, uh, <clears throat> I've been writing this out today and I've got it wrong. A thousand <laughs> units, over a hundred sites over the next 10 years. Um, so we're wanting to do a, a big amount. Um, we're investing literally millions into this um, because we know that we're going to deliver at a quality in locations that are always going to be desirable. Um, so that's the key thing is, you know, make them desirable and it doesn't matter about saturation. And by the way, saturation is, is years away. That, um, the research data that I was telling you about before, um, the, the UK market's currently at $200 million and growing, it's like double 200 million in like, I think about seven years. Um, so, you know, that says that there's going to be twice as much demand, probably twice as much supply as well. And, everyone's still going to be happy apart from the people with gym mats for beds in the back garden. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, there you go, listeners, viewers. If you ever needed a, a stronger statement of uh, intent for the future of the industry, it's right there. Um, Callum, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we will put links in the description to this episode to both our website, but also Abant Glamp as well. So if you've any of what you've heard today is of interest, please do reach out and get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Callum, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Ollie, and thank you for running the podcast. Looking forward to seeing it grow. No problem at all. Cheers. Cheers.